when two atheists, Jordan and Jared, on their podcast, Reason to Doubt, decided to respond to my podcast, top 10 questions to ask an atheist, and then ask me to respond to their response, I knew it was worthy of a podcast or two. Hi, I'm Alec McClellan. This is a Jigsaw Guide to Life. This is the second part of two podcasts to try and respond to Jordan and Jared. In the first part, I've already addressed number 10, how do you get something from nothing? Number nine, how do you get life from non-life? Number eight, how do you get mind from matter? And now number seven, how do you get design without a designer? Jared said, just because you hear the word design doesn't mean that something was designed. Well, Sure, you might use the word in a different way for some reason, but the word, if you want to stick to the definition, means that something was designed. That's why you would use that word. doesn't mean someone can't use it in another way, but even if they did use it, when having the belief that something wasn't designed, why would they choose that word? Well, obviously they see something that suggests to them that there's some kind of pattern or intelligence behind something, and their intuition is that this thing was designed. I need to borrow from one of my great heroes, G.K. Chesterton, to point out and make an observation. Atheists don't dismiss design because their free thinking allows them to reject it. Atheists dismiss design because their presuppositions will not allow them to accept it. Let me say that again. It's worth saying twice. Atheists don't dismiss design because their free thinking allows them to reject it. Atheists dismiss design because their presuppositions will not allow them to accept it. So much for free thought and free thinking. Another thing that that Jared had um, pointed out was he rejected my suggestion that evolution is an unguided mechanism. He said that's not how evolution works, but that is how evolution works. It is an unguided mechanism. Unless you're trying to smuggle in natural selection. I'm not sure anyone's really arguing about natural selection. Evolution is the result of unguided forces. I mean, you can look at it cosmologically. You can look at it biologically. Every time a new kind of thing emerges, it requires a stroke of luck. Why? Well, the gene pool is only so deep. A new kind of thing requires a new kind of gene. And random mutation is the bridge between one kind of thing and another. Random mutation is random. Actually, it generally means you're unlucky. Uh, So it's even harder to end up with something that helps you rather than hurts you. Jordan talked a little bit about things like gravity, natural laws, just part of nature. Well, if it's just part of nature, that's just an assumption and that's circular reasoning. It doesn't answer the question. You just have to assume that it's part of nature. And think about the universe, a universe that exploded into existence. It started out as chaos, not cosmos. And think about our experience whenever there's chaos in society. The only way laws emerge is if a person establishes them. Very quickly on their uh, their, their concern too, that if you're going to argue for design, you have to make sense of bad design too that you see in the world. Now again, what is good design, what is bad design, that's a deeper conversation. But just basically that some things certainly aren't good or the way they ought to be. Certainly atheism has no answer to this, and we'll return to that in a moment, because there is no bad design, there is no good design, there is no bad, there is no good. We lose any kind of absolute standard to make that assessment. But the Christian worldview, one of its great advantages is that it can make sense of the good and the bad, the good and the evil, how this world is broken. And for more information on this, you can watch my podcast, Top 10 Questions, Top 10 Answers, how the Christian worldview answers these questions. How do you get design without a designer? Well, atheism certainly doesn't fit. Number six, how do you explain the problem of evil? Jordan said that, well, there's evil in the universe because the universe doesn't care about us. But the point is there is no evil in the universe, according to atheism. Everything just comes down to personal taste and preference. Jared seemed... um, Uh, to think it was curious that I was quoting Richard Dawkins on this. He said he's no authority on theology or philosophy. Well, Dawkins, even as a scientist, has had a massive influence on popular culture in the areas of theology and philosophy due to his best-selling book, The Clues in the Title, The God Delusion, where he talks about theological and philosophical issues. And his book has sold millions of copies around the world. 
What's more, there's no disputing what Dawkins has to say in the quotes that I used. Maybe it's one reason why Jordan and Jared didn't try to offer any kind of rebuttal. Dawkins isn't out on a limb, which is why I shared the famous quote from famous atheist philosopher of the 20th century, Bertrand Russell, uh, about the same kind of reasoning. The moral argument for God's existence is this. If God does not exist, then objective moral values do not exist. Premise two, objective moral values do exist. Conclusion, therefore, God exists. You can't deny the logic of this argument. But Jordan seems to question the first premise. If, if God does not exist, then objective moral values do not exist. But he doesn't offer any kind of alternative reasoning which is no surprise because many philosophers have struggled to offer any other kind of reasoning to give us an explanation for objective moral values. In fact, in the end, it seems like people just land on God by any other name. We have to come to the conclusion, is this universe just what it is or is there a way this universe ought to be? According to atheism, this world just is what it is. Everything is natural. But the problem of evil raises a question because it seems like there are things in this world that ought not to be, that they ought to be. And according to atheism, it just doesn't fit. Number five, how can life be insignificant? When I talk about significance, I'm talking about a human being's worth and value. I shared how, according to atheism, you're just a speck. You're not special. Jordan and Jared suggested that I just reject a conclusion if it makes me feel icky. Icky must be an American word. We probably in Scotland use the word yucky, but I get the point. My top 10 questions unmask a catalogue of calamities that follow from a godless outlook on life. And this question of significance is one of them. I'm not um, rejecting this because that makes me feel yucky or icky. I'm rejecting this because it doesn't fit. Maybe Jordan and Jared don't uh, have a problem with their lives being insignificant, but they can't deny that throughout the history of the world, millions of people around the world do wrestle with this. It has a huge impact on their life, to the point that if a person believes their life is insignificant, lacking value, it has a crushing effect and leads to all kinds of problems. Now, an atheist could say, well, a human life is valuable, but it's important to note that this is extrinsic value. This is the kind of value that's not essential to the thing itself. I'm arguing for a person having intrinsic value, a value that is essential to the thing itself, part of the core identity of a person. Now, maybe Jordan and Jared are not moved by this. Many atheists are moved by this, thankfully, and they get involved in reaching out and helping others. But the, the question I want to raise and the point I want to underline is that an atheistic worldview doesn't drive their compassion. In fact, it undermines it. You can have an atheist that is caring and compassionate. We have many who are reaching out to people who are struggling with the issue of significance and value. But the point is their worldview as an atheist doesn't drive that compassion. It undermines it because according to atheism, you're not special. You're just a speck. And what's more, if you decide your life is insignificant, no one else really has the authority to correct you. Number four, life, how can life be meaningless? I'm talking about meaning, talking about purpose, human purpose. Again, maybe this doesn't move the needle for Jordan and Jared, but history shows the world is captivated by this question. You don't have to read Russell or Nietzsche or Dostoevsky. You can read Douglas Adams, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, who posited that if this world is irrational, doesn't really have the meaning we're looking for, what's written on the book, don't panic. He understands panic ensues from that conclusion. Jordan said that, well, su subjective meaning is still meaning, and that's all that matters to him. But that kind of subjective meaning, well, it can be established, it can come, but also it can go. It can be given, it can be taken away. It's no foundation to build your life on. What's more, the idea that life ought to have meaning is something that resonates with many of us. And according to atheism, it just doesn't fit. Number three, how can there be no human freedom? The atheist who rejects determinism uh, but views there as human freedom, well, it's some kind of anomaly. It's perhaps an emergent property. It just squirts into existence. But the fact is, is if we are simply just nature and nurture, 
we are determined by our genes and our environment. Now, any suggestion about quantum indeterminacy uh, it maybe undermines determinism, but it doesn't lead to any explanation of human freedom where we make choices, where we actually choose to do or not to do. Jordan Jared ultimately seemed to suggest that free will might just be an illusion. What a huge price to pay. Something that it seems so obvious to us, one of the most basic human intuitions. It's just a, an illusion and that we have to live in denial because we think we're making choices, but really not. That's a huge price to pay. And so it's too costly for me, I'm afraid. Uh, how do you make sense of human freedom? Atheism doesn't fit. Question number two, how can there be no human identity? Atheism can't make sense of human identity uh, persisting through physical change. And so Jared and Jordan wrestled with the question to a degree, you know, what is the essence of identity? According to an atheist, well, is it just the physical stuff? As Bertrand Russell said, are we simply just the outcome of an accidental collocation of atoms? If we're just physical stuff, well, there is no identity through physical change. And that's a huge problem for atheism. But maybe they want to try and impute identity from the outside. For example, Jared talked about his favourite baseball team, the Detroit Tigers. He said, hey, it's still the Detroit Tigers, even though the players and things have changed over the years. Well, here's the problem. When identity is imputed from the outside, as Jared said, it's still the Tigers. But someone else might say, hey, they're not the team they used to be. So who gets to decide? You see, if you impute identity from the outside, that identity can be given and just as easily that identity can be taken away. And that is a huge danger when you think about the importance of a person having identity. In fact, we've seen in history where people have decided to give and take away human identity, leading to horrific consequences. Well, as I'm running out of time, straight to number one, how is there no basis for rationality? Well, uh, again, whether or not um, Jared thought this was very important, this is central to everything rationality. Jordan made some kind of natural selection argument. He said over time, the false beliefs are weeded out. For example, gravity is true, and we've learned that's true over experience. Now, pragmatism may coincide with truth, but it's no authority on the matter. I could have a belief that walking under a ladder brings me bad luck and that may keep me alive because there's less things likely to drop on my head, but that doesn't mean the belief is true. If our brain, when we know, is ultimately the result of unguided forces, means there's no reason to believe what our brain tells us is true. Every reason to believe it because it is pragmatic. It's not a truth-telling mechanism. How can there be no basis for rationality? Atheism doesn't fit. So my top 10 questions to ask an atheist, I really appreciate Jordan and Jared taking time to interact with them. But again, as a consequence, when you examine these questions, they found in the end, many of them didn't seem to move the needle. They said, ultimately, for many of these questions, they do not care. But if you do care about these questions, you must come to the conclusion that atheism is a worldview found wanting. If you care about how can something come from nothing? How can life come from non-life? How can mind come from matter? How do you get design without a designer? How do you solve the problem of evil? How can life be insignificant? How can life be meaningless? How can you make sense of free will? How can you make sense of human identity? How is there no basis for rationality? If these are important to you, you must conclude that atheism doesn't fit. It's a worldview found wanting and it ought to give you reason to consider the Christian worldview and watch my podcast, Top 10 Questions, Top 10 Answers, to see a worldview that fits.